All right, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank you for attending the webinar today. My name is Stephanie Lesko. I'm the office manager at Lorain County Public Health. And I'm here to introduce our health commissioner, Dave Koval, who will give a presentation today on the history of public health. Dave has a Bachelor of Science in Biology and Environmental Science from Bowling Green State University. He also has a Master of Public Health from The Ohio State University. Before becoming Lorain County Public Health's Health Commissioner in 2012, he was Deputy Director at the Cuyahoga County Board of Health. Dave, I'll go ahead and pass on the webinar controls to you so you can start your presentation. Welcome everyone. So I'm gonna talk a little bit today about um, the history of public health and uh, kind of go through what we do here at Lorain County Public Health in, is in a, kind of a view from history and what, we, um, what that history has taught us and, and where we're going next. And, uh, and so uh, the presentation will be 10 or 15 minutes and then we'll open it up for questions, uh, which Stephanie will moderate uh, that part. So hang on tight. Okay. Uh, so first, let me give you a little bit of a background here uh, about what we do here at Lorain County Public Health. And so, uh, you know, we work very hard to try to prevent people from getting sick or injured here in Lorain County. We have lots of programs that do that. Um, obviously, you probably know we inspect every restaurant that you eat in and every grocery store you buy food in. Uh, and we um, spend a lot of time educating, inspecting those restaurants and, and food uh, venues to uh, try to make sure that uh, we avoid uh, food poisoning. And uh, some of the other things we do is uh, obviously we do childhood vaccines and vaccines for all age groups um, and, uh, and including COVID-19, but, but also uh, meningitis and um, a, you know, a variety of other uh, vaccines. And we've been doing that for quite a while. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of vaccines during this presentation. Uh, one of the other uh, pieces we do uh, is we really work on chronic disease and we help uh, communities design walkable and bikeable communities so that people can get out safely and walk in their community and again, uh, work on some of those chronic diseases. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about that. I think the big message I wanna give you uh, is that we really spend a lot of time um, using data from our community to find out what we should be concentrating on next whether that is hard data around diseases or uh, survey data to find out what people are concerned about. We spend a lot of time doing that so we can make data-driven decisions going forward. Just a, a quick uh, view of our finances. So we diversify our, our finances, not unlike people do for their own investments uh, so that we have some flexibility. Uh, we have some uh, from fees and grants and other things like that. And then about a third of our budget comes from, from the, le the public health levy, um, the one that will be coming up here uh, this fall. And I know it doesn't sound like much because again, it's only $16 per year per $100,000 house. So in other words, it's not a lot for individuals in the community, but it means a lot to us. You can see it, it, it generates about a third of our, of our um, uh, finance, uh, of our income. And that really helps us uh, to, to really help the community uh, stay safe uh, and, and again, avoid disease. And that, that's really what we're all about. So next, Let's talk a little bit about me. Uh, so I'm the health commissioner and Stephanie said, uh, I've been here since 2012 and prior to that worked at Cuyahoga County Board of Health for tw 25 years. And, um, and my main job here, you know, I laugh uh, and kid a little bit about, you know, I just sit in the office and everyone else does all the work. You know, we have over hundred employees here at Lorain County Public Health, all really working hard every day. And, uh, but really what I, what I concentrate on is management and leadership and really look at the budget and make sure that we can financially support uh, the organization going forward so that um, all of our uh, opportunities that come up, we can take advantage of and really, um, really help the community. And so that's really where I concentrate most of my time uh, is helping in our, in our management team. So probably the biggest uh, thing I love about the job is really teaching people how to be successful in public health. And so uh, for those of you who don't know, we are very concentrated on um, being efficient and effective and, and really using tax dollars in a smart way to really make the, the get the best bang for our buck and really understand um, how we're impacting the community. And so that's what I really love to do is to teach people how to run a public agency like a business so that you can, you can keep the doors open and keep helping people for as long as we can. So that's, that's really what I'm all about. Uh, and a unique fact about me is that I've gone skydiving six times. And, and uh, that's something that I did as I was uh, a little bit younger, uh, just as an adventure kind of thing. And uh, something I, I look back on fondly. 
Okay, so speaking of looking back on the past, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the history of public health. So, so back in 1918 was the, the um, big Spanish flu pandemic that happened uh, here in Ohio, here in the country and across the world. And it, it uh, killed uh, about 25 million people worldwide. And again, uh, the world population was obviously a lot less then, uh, but it really set some alarm bells off here in Ohio. And uh, here in Lorain, Lorain County, uh, in the city of Lorain, um, William Hughes was um, a representative and he actually um, in 1919 um, recommended that we have the Hughes Griswold Act and, and start local health departments. And really the Hughes Griswold Act really um, designed what public health looks like today. And so uh, it established all the local health departments in a partnership with the Ohio Department of Health. And back then in 1920, when Lorain County Public Health started, we were in the uh, city hall at Oberlin. Uh, for those of you who are history buffs, you may know that Oberlin was the, was the county seat at that time. And so we were in a little office building in city hall uh, back then. In the 20s, we spent a lot of time uh, doing milk inspections and again, uh, vaccinating folks for the vaccine that was available. And, and you know, other, uh, we looked at other kind of diseases that were, that were um, farm related in many cases, um, but uh, that's really where we spent a lot of our time. And then in the 30s, uh, the food stamp uh, program came in and, and we don't really run the food stamp program. It's now called SNAP the, um, the um, Supplemental Nutrition uh, um, Assistant Program. And one of our big pieces that we connect with with SNAP though, is the importance of, of good eating uh, and really helping folks um, get the nutrition that they need. And that's still a common theme here today. And so a good example of how we're still connecting the dots there is we really work with our farm markets to actually accept SNAP benefits. So the people who are um, getting um, uh, assistance can actually get fresh fruits and vegetables. And that's really the key. So let's move on into the 40s. And so um, in, in the late 40s, we began to do a restaurant inspection program here in Lorain County. And in 1953, Ohio um, adopted uh, laws and rules associated with all restaurant inspections. And so uh, we've been inspecting every restaurant and every grocery store ever since. And so that was one of the big pieces. Just in 2018, we had, we had about 4,000 food inspections that we, that we conducted here in Lorain County. So that kind of gives you an idea of how many uh, facilities were out there um, inspecting and educating and kind of teaching people how to create a good food product that also you know, won't get sick. And so that's really where we spend most of our time in terms of food safety. Uh, and then in the 50s, uh, polio was really um, obviously a, a big concern. And so the polio vaccine started, um, program started. And, and uh, in 1955, right after that came out, uh, it was unbelievable the impact. There, you know, the uh, polio cases dropped by over 50%. And again, we were well on our way to begin to eradicate polio, uh, which was a scourge of our time, uh, you know, at that particular time. And so just to think about that in terms of today's terms, in 2018, we vaccinated over 9,000 people. We, we uh, administer over 9,000 vaccines to folks. And that's, you know, everything from uh, measles to pertussis to, uh, you know, um, meningitis and many others. And so again, that vaccine um, program really started rolling uh, back with the polio vaccine and has been going ever since and, and uh, all the way into COVID-19. So uh, in the in the 40s, you can see a picture here of uh, the Lorain County children with medical handicaps visits. So we still actually visit um, uh, families. Uh, one of our nurses contacts uh, families that have a, a, a child with a medical handicap. And, uh, you know, these families are struggling already with um, the burden of, of trying to help their child grow, uh, you know, in this kind of a situation. And, and we really, uh, our nurses are there to help them navigate the system, to help them understand, um, you know, other things that they can be looking at to kind of make their lives a little easier and help their child grow safely. And so that's something we're still doing here today. Um, matter of fact, uh, just in 2018, we had almost a thousand um, visits with families with a, a child with a mental health handicap. Okay, so let's move into the 70s a little. So in 1974, the WIC program started, uh, Women, Infants, and uh, Children. Uh, it was a childhood nutrition program to help moms uh, understand how to um, how to provide good nutrition for their, for their children. And you can see a picture from 1983 uh, from the WIC program here. 
Uh, and so, so we provided uh, just in 2018 um, in our two offices, one in Elyria, Elyria and one in Lorraine, uh, over 7,000 client visits to really help moms and babies uh, uh, stay healthy. And so that's still a program here that's uh, very active here today. Now, uh, in the in the 70s and 80s, um, there became uh, more of an, an important need around home sewage inspection. So uh, household sewage systems began to be regulated and, and looked at a little closer. And uh, so we have, believe it or not, over 20,000 uh, household sewage systems here in Lorain County. And we still look at them today. Um, we did about a little about almost 1200 um, inspections over the last uh, year in 2018 to, to kind of really uh, take a look at household sewage systems and help homeowners figure out what was going on with their systems. And so uh, that, that program still goes and it's really all about protecting the watersheds here in Lorain County so that the rivers and the lake um, stay clean and a good resource for us all. So I think this, um, this picture on the right, um, it really is uh, an incredible picture. So think about how far we've come. Uh, so this is a picture from 1961, uh, where Sears was offering an auto strap for $1.88 to, to help your child stay in their seat um, while, they're in, uh, while they're in the vehicle. So, you know, it is amazing that seat belts really weren't, didn't get rolling here until the 80s. In 1986 um, was when Ohio passed a law that you, you must wear a seat belt in, your, in, in a vehicle. And so, again, we spent a lot of time with car seats uh, and uh, also um, a lot of safety um, it, uh, work around with the Lorain County uh, Safe Communities Coalition uh, to really kind of help people with um, uh, really controlling drunk driving and talking about seatbelt safety and, and other, and other uh, areas where we can try to keep people safe on the road. And so we work closely with the sheriff and the, and the um, State Highway Patrol and other partner um, police uh, um, uh, jurisdictions and other partners here in Lorain County. And you may have attended our Zero Proof Mix Off where we talk about the promotion of designated driving and, and making sure uh, that people aren't drunk driving, dr drinking and driving around the holidays. So that, those are some of the areas that, that we uh, handle. And then one other big piece that really came in the 90s was um, a back to sleep campaign. So it was really about safe sleep. And, and uh, so at that time, SIDS deaths or crib deaths were, were very high. And after that back to sleep campaign uh, started, we actually reduced um, the uh, childhood deaths uh, from crib deaths uh, by about 50%. And so that really helped, uh, you know, in terms of our infant mortality numbers here in Lorain County. And to this day, we still give out cribs to those who don't have one. So we have a pack and plays that, in, and just in 2018, we gave out 315 to moms who do not, did not have a safe crib for their child to sleep in. And so again, we, we try to do everything we can to educate new moms to keep their baby safe. So let's talk a little more modern. Um, it just in, uh, in 2001, you may remember, uh, West Nile virus hit the region. And in 2001, um, uh, that this mosquito-borne disease came in and, and really was a, a, an emerging infectious disease, not unlike COVID-19. And, uh, and so we had to address it um, uh, very quickly. And so again, we had a mosquito control program. And so what we did was we began trapping and trying to test for these, uh, these, this virus inside our mosquito population. And, uh, and again, uh, did a lot of treatment to try to knock down the mosquito population to avoid people from getting West Nile virus. Uh, and then in 2006, we actually uh, were actively a part of the Smoke Free Ohio law, which actually uh, have encouraged folks to uh, stop smoking indoors. Uh, and then we also work on other smoke free um, type of activities like uh, policies for local communities on smoke-free environments uh, to, again, reduce the amount of people who are smoking and doing a lot of education around uh, prevention of tobacco product, you know, smoking and, and uh, reduction in tobacco product use. So, again, a, an important piece, especially when we start talking about chronic disease, uh, tobacco use is a big uh, contributor to chronic disease. In 2009, uh, is when the last pandemic came through. And, and it wasn't as big as, to, as obviously uh, COVID-19, but in H, when H1N1 came through, um, it was really, uh, it had a pretty dramatic impact on us. And so uh, we had to create um, uh, mass vaccination sites, much like we did this past year. And we vaccinated almost 10,000 people from, for, uh, for H1N1. And again, we, this was older adults that were, uh, were really concerned with, with H1N1 and did a lot of vaccine around that. 
Um, the other uh, piece I guess I want to address on this slide is really, if you look to the right, we, we, you look at a nice crossing uh, um, uh, area where you can actually cross safely and more walkability. And that's really what we've been working on in terms of chronic disease when it comes to uh, local communities. And so uh, I want to, there's a Surgeon General quote I want to talk about uh, from 2015. The journey to better health begins with a single step. It really was a, a kind of a, a, a call to action, if you will, um, for local health departments to try to help communities figure out how to make things more walkable and bikeable so we can all get out and exercise a little bit more. And if you could make the healthy choice, the easy choice, then people would do it. And so again, access to fresh fruits and vegetables and ability to walk and bike safely could really have a long-term impact on our communities. And so we've been doing quite a bit along that. And then I wanted to talk about one more thing. So remember, I talked about uh, all the way back to, to um, 1919 and the Spanish flu pandemic. So back in 1919, uh, the average life expectancy for men was 37 and for women was 42. Think about that for a minute. In a hundred years, we've really added over 25 years of expected life. Men's men, uh, average life expectancy now is 76 and women 81. And so again, you think about all of the different pieces that we just talked about from vaccine to uh, clean water and clean food and uh, to, uh, to again, uh, walkable and bikeable uh, communities and, and tobacco prevention really has uh, done quite a bit to help people live a lot longer and a healthier life. So 2020, well, that's a whole nother presentation. So um, as just kind of a little uh, cliffhanger uh, next week, uh, Mark Adams will be doing a presentation on, uh, on what happened in the last 18 months around COVID-19. Uh, and there's certainly been uh, quite a bit of action uh, here at Lorain County Public Health over the last 18 months and lots to talk about. But once again, you'll have to wait uh, and, and tune into that presentation. So let's talk about the future. Um, when you think about what public health looks like today compared to back in those early days of the 1900s and, and as I walk through that history. You know, in the earlier days, it was infectious disease that were the leading causes of death. Now the leading causes of death are heart disease and cancer, these chronic diseases. And so again, um, really, we're going to be concentrating a lot on chronic disease prevention and, and how we can make um, uh, places uh, really more walkable and bikeable and you know, how do we uh, deal with unintended, unintended injuries and heart disease and, you know, diabetes and a variety of other things. And so we'll continue to do that and have walking clubs and do a variety of other pieces. We'll also continue to um, do things like we, we vaccinate uh, people for HPV. As, as we know, HPV causes cancer and, uh, and, you know, can lead to cancer. And so if we can prevent that um, uh, virus, we can actually uh, prevent many of those um, cancer cases. And so again, we'll keep moving those uh, through and, and we'll look at tobacco and, and tobacco policies. And one of the other more creative things that we did just recently uh, is work with the libraries to, to have them uh, have a, um, an ability for you to check out uh, a, a blood pressure cuff so that just like you do a book so that you can actually ma maintain your own blood pressure and understand what's going on with your blood pressure uh, so that you can actually avoid uh, you know any kind of um, bad health outcome. So again, that's just a, an example of some of the things we're doing in the community to try to look at these chronic diseases over time. One of the other pieces that really helped us during, um, during the last year is emergency preparedness. So uh, in early two th in, in late 2001, early after um, uh, September 11th, we began to really look at uh, emergency preparedness in a different way. Uh, we were concerned about bioterrorist events. We really began to create lots of plans and understand what to do with those plans. And we practiced with those plans. And, and so, and then when H1N1 came, we, we implemented many of those plans. And, and we do, uh, we're on other groups, you know, uh, where we work with the police and the fire and the crime lab to when we looked at suspicious substances and other things like that. So again, we practiced quite a bit. And boy, it came in it came in handy because when the time came for for mass vaccination, we were ready, and we had all the partnerships set up already. And so again, uh, that's really uh, an important piece for us. Uh, all of our people are trained in incident command so that they can actually understand what to do in an emergency situation, and and we also practiced 
um, a lot of these uh, pod drills and other um, drills so that we, um, we could be ready for mass vaccination. And so once a year, we would take one of our flu clinics and turn it into a mass vaccination clinic so we could practice how to do it when the time came. And again, all that came through. And that's probably one of the reasons here in Lorain County, we were one of the most efficient ways, um, one of the most efficient departments when it came to vaccinating folks uh, for COVID-19. But I've said this many times here inside the organization, and I want to make sure you hear this also. It, really, it's about people, right? Looking to the future is all about people. How do we train new people? And so training our existing staff is important, but also uh, we provide internship opportunities and environmental health and health promotion. Uh, and again, if, if you're interested in something like that, or you know somebody who's interested in the field like this, they're in a, they're a biology or, or a health promotion, or they're in, um, or, or they're a nurse or, or other, other areas where they might be interested in public health, or maybe they haven't even figured out what they wanna do yet. Have them contact us at lorainecountyhealth.com and we'd be more than happy to set up an internship in the summer or if they're not quite ready and they're in high school or they're, or, or they're, or they're in college, but they're not sure what they're gonna major in yet, have them contact us, they can do a shadowing opportunity and we can have them shadow one of our sanitarians inspecting restaurants or, or one of our health promotion folks talking about walkable and bikeable environments or, or even maybe even sample in a beach. And uh, again, these opportunities are out there. So please uh, take that opportunity. So speaking of taking the opportunity, I think a really big piece that I'd like to make sure you hear today is you, you have the opportunity to get more engaged, right? And so maybe that's telling other people about our services. Maybe it's your own, uh, it's your own ability to, to utilize those services. So again, we have vaccines for a variety of things, obviously COVID-19, but other, many others. We have services for new moms. I've touched a little bit on some of them. And so again, you can kind of look into that if, you, if you're if you a new mom or are going to be a new mom, or you have someone who's a member of your family or, or a loved one that is, uh, again, uh, that that's an opportunity for you. And then also, uh, you know, we have a lot of folks in the community, unfortunately, struggling with uh, drug addiction. And uh, and so we really provide Narcan and medical safes for uh, opiate-based pain meds so that we can make sure that we can try to help people. Uh, and so, again, if you know someone who's struggling with this, just reach out to us at LorainCountyHealth.com and we can help you with that. Also, maybe you have an older adult in your family uh, that is struggling with prescriptions and the cost of and the burden of those prescriptions. We have a prescri prescription assistance program that you can sign up for and we can kind of help you with that and try to get some of those costs reduced. So again, lots of opportunities there and, and also an opportunity to advocate. You're, there's always that. Uh, so you can always join a team at lorainecountyhealth.com uh, slash partnerships and, and uh, talk about you know, health policies in your own community and how you can help uh, create a, a healthier and safer community than the community that you live in. So with that, I guess we'll, uh, we'll open it up. I'll stop sharing my screen and we'll, we'll open it up for questions and I'll, I'll have um, Stephanie kind of um, uh, moderate and um, give me any questions you might have and I'll try to answer them. Sure, so while you were presenting, we did get a few questions in the chat feature. So our first question is, how do we get parents to vaccinate for polio? It seems much harder to get families to vaccinate for COVID. Yes, that is a, that's a dilemma that we're in now. So I think the difference was in the 50s uh, with polio, you still had some people that were a little concerned, but, but it was such a national crisis and everyone got behind it. And in the 50s, that's kind of how America was. And sadly, um, over the last few years, we've seen social media and other um, uh, platforms that have promoted the conspiracy theories and all these other things. And unfortunately, that's a virus that we're gonna be fighting a lot longer than COVID-19 is this bad information virus. And so nobody trusts anybody unless they say something that they already agree with. And so that is sad. Um, and unfortunately it's costing people's lives. People have not gotten vaccinated and it's too late once you're, once you're in the hospital and in the ICU. And so um, the best we can do here in public health is we try to give a straightforward and honest answer to questions and, and hope that we can cut through some of the noise that's out there. But that is going to be a long-term struggle and, uh, and, and one that I think um, is going to have adverse effects until we can figure it out. Thank you, Dave. 
Another question would be, can you please tell us a little bit more about outreach? And in this question, they specifically ask about public health nurses and going to the schools. But if you could tell a little bit about the other types of outreach we do as well. Yeah, so um, we do a variety of uh, things in terms of that. And uh, so one piece of the puzzle is we have a community health um, assessment that we do uh, to, that really reaches out to different uh, groups to ask their opinion about what's going on in the community and also about you know medical scenarios. And then we, um, we create a uh, community health improvement plan out of that to kind of really look at hard data around who, why are people getting sick in our community and then tie that into concerns that the community members might have. So that's a kind of a max Macro uh, view, if you will, a large uh, view of what we do. But then the other um, things that we do is uh, we we do uh, connect with our local communities, whether that's city halls and mayors, uh, the township trustees and, and elected officials, to kind of talk through with them on, on what and what's going on in the community. And then again, we have school nurses in most of the schools. Some schools have their own nurses, but most of them have us. So again, we stay connected with the children and what's going on with them. And so again, these are just some ways that we do that. Um, there are also minority groups that we work with quite a bit to get some information on, like El Centro and the Urban League and other folks to really kind of get an idea of what's going on in, in pockets that are harder to figure out and harder to reach. And so we have a, a small groups working in, in a variety of ways to, to kind of get as much information about the community as we can. Thank you. What community health events are in Lorraine and where can we find more information about them? So I might need a little clarity on a community health event, um, but I, I would say, um, so in Lorraine, uh, we do a variety of different work. Obviously we have our, our WIC location in Lorraine, that's at uh, Lorraine County Health and Dentistry. Uh, and then we do a variety of things around um, Live Healthy Lorraine, uh, which is a group that actually um, works on walkability and bikeability in Lorraine. Um, and then we have uh, so a food forward group that talks about um, uh, um, Food, food, access to uh, fresh fruits and vegetables and access to all food uh, for people who are food insecurity. Uh, so we have some other groups like that that are in Lorraine that uh, we're happy to have you be part of. So again, go to LorraineCountyHealth.com and leave that message and then we'll, and we'll make sure that we get you connected with the right, uh, the right uh, group. And we did receive a response. Thank you for the answer to that question. We have received a couple of thank yous to you and your staff for the work that you've done during the COVID-19 pandemic, just letting you know that the work is valued. Uh, I don't see any additional, oh, excuse me. Is there some place to read more on the history of public health in Lorraine? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, yes, we had an Oberlin student actually contact us a few years ago, uh, who was a history major who wanted to do some work around this because it was our 100th anniversary since, you know, the great uh, uh, Spanish flu uh, pandemic. And so we uh, have some stuff on our website right now that has kind of the history of public health. I also teach a, uh, I do a one day um, class at Oberlin uh, to do a kind of a broader uh, picture of this. It's an hour long piece as part of one of their um, classes. Um, and, but again, it's kind of start with our website. You can really see a great narrative about how public health developed over the years uh, here in, in Lorraine County. All right, we'll give it a moment to see, receiving a thank you for that response. I don't see any additional questions on our chat feature. And we'll uh, that was really interesting. Thank you. Uh, always ways to find out about volunteering. Uh, would you be able to speak a little bit about our volunteer program? Yeah, so the, so boy, H1N1, I'm mean, sorry, uh, H1N1, we started this uh, medical reserve corps piece and boy, uh, COVID-19 really, uh, really solidified it. So um, if you're a medical uh, provider in any way, uh, MRC is a really uh, great place to go. So you can go to our website and connect with the MRC and be part of our medical reserve corps to help out. God forbid we have another pandemic, but, uh, or, for, or for any of our uh, other activities. And then you can always, we are, we are the um, uh, facilitator for a lot of collaboratives between us and United Way and, and, and some other groups in the community. So if you if reach out to us, there's lots of opportunities to come and volunteer and kind of just help, help in your own community to, to discern, you know, discern what really is needed and, and kind of move in that direction. So we're happy to put, add you to those groups. Uh, and we do say have people saying they are part of the MRC and it's been wonderful working with us. 
Another question would be, what types of services can you walk in for at Lorain County Public Health? Well, so uh, boy, that could take a while, but I'll, I'll give you the highlights. So environmental health, obviously um, we have uh, um, uh, licenses for, for restaurants and we help people get open and we teach them how to you know, do the basic food safety stuff. And so we do those kind of things. And obviously if you have a problem with your sewage system or anything like that, those are all walk-in services. You can come in at any time in environmental health and we'll help you with that. Um, and then uh, in community health, we have an immunization clinic open pretty much every day. And so you can get a COVID vaccine or you can get other vaccines. All you'd have to do is call. It's a little more efficient if you, if you call for an appointment just so that you can know exactly when to come. Uh, and then of course, we also do um, uh, birth and death records. And so if you go to our vital statistics group, you can walk in and get a copy of your birth certificate and, or death certificate that you may need. Um, and then uh, other walk-in services, you know, WIC is a really good example. You usually will make an appointment, but you can do some walk-ins uh, where you can get, um, if you have a new baby, um, and be part of, uh, you know, kind of WIC, and you'll meet with a dietitian and some other things like that. And so those are some of the walk-in services we do uh, here at the, at the health district. So um, I, I would say in most cases, uh, if you've got something you're concerned about uh, that's in public health, we probably have something that addresses it. So just reach out to us and and we can connect. Thank you, Dave. And I'm not seeing any additional questions. Oh, all right, we did have one pop through. Are there any ideas to reach the target group under 30 years of age and not traditional TV viewers and caught up with conspiracy theories? Yeah, so I have a 25 and a 23 year old that aren't quite there, but um, even, them are, even they are very hard to connect with. So. Uh, we do uh, some work on social media to try to do that, but again, you know, that becomes uh, more difficult. So um, it, it's hard to cut through the noise. And so um, it, it, that is really one of the more difficult uh, groups for us. Now we do have, we do have um, scenarios where we can actually get some input from them in terms of what they're concerned about in the community. But again, they're also someone, the 30 somethings are usually pretty healthy. And so we don't really deal with them unless they're starting to have children, in which case we help, you know, we work with them there. So in terms of uh, reaching them on a message around COVID-19 or other things like that, it's their been, they have been the hardest group. We do use some social media to do that, but how effective it is, is, you know, is debatable. Thank you. Okay. Not seeing any additional ones. Thank you for that response. A uh, question that we have, uh, I have a cruise planned in November, which may require me to get a COVID test on Thanksgiving. Do you know where I could get a test on Thanksgiving Day? Uh, well, so first I would say that if you get vaccinated, in most cases, you don't, you may not need to have a test and that's probably going to continue as we move forward. Um, if you do need a test, uh, urgent cares, almost all the urgent cares have them now, and they're usually open on Thanksgiving, uh, at least some of them are. And so that's where I would reach out to, um, there's an in instant test that you can get from us, but I'm not sure if that would qualify. Cause again, they'll have some very specific uh, qualifications. Otherwise, you could get one of our instant tests and take it home and, and use it. But unfortunately, I don't think that's going to qualify for, for the requirement. So uh, again, get vaccinated first. That's really the best because most likely they'll let you on without the test. Right, thank you. Give it a moment to see if we have anything additional coming in. All right, um, not seeing any additional questions. Dave, thank you very much for the presentation on the history of public health. Thank you to our attendees for this webinar. Uh, we will have a recording available soon and you'll get more information on that. Uh, like David said, we do have another webinar next week and that is with our Deputy Health Commissioner, Mark Adams, and he will be talking about the COVID-19 pandemic. So I know quite a few of our questions on this one we're geared towards COVID-19. So we hope that you can join us next week for that webinar. The information on how to register will be on our Facebook page, or you can look to our website. Uh, we hope you have a wonderful day and stay safe out there. Thank you.